Hi, a oh, very good evening, all of you. Welcome to our first live session of this week, Case-Based Discussions Made Easy. So before we start, as you know, the objectives, make sure that you're enjoying the process of learning. Exam is approaching for 2022 aspirants, and I know how it must be for you, but no matter what, just focus on enjoying the process. And I'm sure you're going to learn a lot, and I'm definitely confident that you're going to do great in any task that you take up. But before that, make sure that uh, you're enjoying the learning process. And also whenever you come across anything, uh, it can be any information from standard references, including that of our sessions, make sure that you're maintaining a customized notes. Consider that very, very important, right? So uh, without much delay, let's go ahead with our case-based discussion today. And I hope it is all streaming fine. If you have any issues, do let me know in the comment section. And once again, a very good evening to each and every one of you. Hi, Rishikesh, Kritika, hi. Hi, Chaitanya. Hi, Sidra, Sujay, Nishita, Madhuri, Rishika, Ritu, Rashmi, Smriti. Yes. A very good evening, all of you. Chaitanya seems to be having some issue with his uh, application upload. So you can contact NB Helpline and see what uh, they would say in regard to your application form. Since edit window is closed, Try contacting NBA helpline, either through mail or through their toll-free number. I reckon it's toll-free. Try contacting them and see if they can offer any assistance or, you know, uh, any relevant information in this regard, Chaitanya. So let's go ahead. So before we start, as I mentioned, as I've been mentioning for the past one week, we launched a grand test batch, crash course batch from this week. So you can find all the details in the description part of this video. So you'll have access to 10 grand tests along with three revision tests. And also you'll be given access to a study club discussion group at Telegram. And then we're also launching this one year course, Mission 12 Batch towards NEET MDS 2023 with a new batch or new schedule starting from this month. So you can find all relevant details, including that of schedule in the description part of this video. Or you can log into our website, pdbdacademy.com. Or you can even drop us a mail at proudtobedentist at gmail.com, right? So uh, let's start with an amazing, wonderful quote. Accept no one's definition of your life. Define yourself. So uh, this is something which is very much important for each and every one of us uh, in every phase or every stage of life. Do not accept one's definition of your life. Define yourself as quoted by Harvey Feierstein. So once you, you go with others' definition, it means you're in a sort of trap. Just be uh, open, keep observing what's happening around you. And why don't you define your life for yourself? rather than following some ready-made definitions or ready-made materials, like that of preparation. So no one's definition really matters to you. What really matters is how you are evolving your perceptions, how you are developing your perspectives and how you are defining yourself. You need not fall into others' trap. You need not blindly go by what others say. You have your own life, this one life of yours, and you can make it amazing. You have that potential. So accept no one's definition of your life. Just define yourself. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, in the context of preparation, only those who get AAR1 are successful and others are failures. So that's, again, one definition which the society is giving you. Simply reject that kind of definitions. No matter how much you score, no matter which rank you secure, ultimately what matters is, are you giving your best towards what you're doing? It can be any task, it can be preparation, or it can be anything for that matter in life. 
Are you giving your best? Because once you start giving your best, you'll start experiencing best. And uh, it's like you're enhancing your own life in the process, right? So just keep giving your best, regardless or irrespective of the results or the output. And the secret here is once you start giving your best, once you start enjoying the process, you will have successful results or desired output as a natural consequence, right? So without much delay, let's go ahead with our case-based uh, discussion now. So this is the context you have. A patient visits a clinic for routine dental checkup and intraoral examination reveals calculus. You advise ultrasonic scaling and upon completing the treatment, you schedule an appointment after two weeks to evaluate soft tissue response to scaling. After two days, however, you get a call from your friendly neighborhood dentist saying that this patient visited him and upon clinical examination, bleeding on probing was positive. So it's like a story for you. So you can go through this story once again. And you can look into those highlighted areas or highlighted in red. So as I keep on reminding, a context-based or case-based question is relatively easy to answer if you know the key areas in this particular context. And if you have some background information, it's in fact easy to answer this question rather than other format questions, that is directly asked questions like what is the refractive index of an animal? Or which periodontal ligament fibers have this specific function. So that's in fact challenging in my opinion, but a context-based or case-based question makes things even more interesting and not just interesting, but also easy to answer. So, and as I already said, the only challenge you have is time constraint. So you should be able to do this at a faster pace because the given, uh, given the kind of uh, inputs you have, uh, you should be able to answer it as fast as possible so that you can address other questions also. Yeah. Yes, uh, Viba says NBMS will open final edit window from 12th to 15th February. Okay, Viba, thank you for the update. So Chaitanya, if you're hearing to this, you can just check out that comment and keep a tab on mb.edu.it. So you have seen this particular case, you have seen this particular context. Uh, it's not about finding out the exact uh, diagnosis, but we'll get back to the question. So I hope you got a good uh, look of this particular context. And let me summarize. So a patient comes to you, you observe calculus, you go for scaling and after completing treatment, you uh, schedule another appointment for re-evaluation of soft tissues so that you want to see how soft tissues are responding to this uh, procedure of scaling. Ultrasonic scaling, hand scaling, okay, consider this as ultrasonic scaling. So after two days, however, you get a call from another dentist whom this patient has visited for some reason, right? Maybe he is suspicious of your treatment. Maybe he was not satisfied. So reasons aside, that friendly neighborhood dentist, right? He calls you and says that bleeding and probing was positive. Now, with this context in mind, try answering this first question. Bleeding on probing immediately after scaling indicates the following. So as in this case, uh, second day itself, there was bleeding on probing after scaling. So what does it indicate? Option A, you performed scaling aggressively. Option B, it's a sign of persistent inflammation. Option C, it's a normal finding. Option D, your friendly neighborhood dentist is not that friendly. So which one do you think is a more appropriate answer? So bleeding on probing immediately after scaling. So what does it indicate? So try answering this question. In the meantime, let me review some information from current latest edition. So the adequacy of scaling and root planning is evaluated when the procedure is performed. Again, later, after a period of soft tissue healing, immediately after instrumentation, the tooth surfaces should be carefully inspected visually with optimal lighting, mouth mirror, compressed air, and of course, we also use a fine explorer or a probe. As you know, scaling, it's all about removing the plaque as well as calculus, supragingival as well as subgingival. 
root planing, as you know, we plane the surface where there is intentional removal of cementum deposits also in an attempt to clear or create a kind of hard, smooth, clean surface. So in case of root planing, we remove calculus, embedded calculus material or particles and also the cementum material. But in case of scaling, we don't go with tooth structure removal, right? At least intentionally. So subgenual surfaces should be hard and smooth. Although complete removal of calculus is definitely necessary for health of adjacent soft tissues, little documented evidence of the necessity for smoothness is available. Nevertheless, relative smoothness is still the best immediate clinical indication that calculus has been completely removed. I, I would like to repeat this point and do make a note of it. Relative smoothness is still the best immediate clinical indication that calculus has been completely removed. It's an immediate indication. So what's the best late indication? It's a soft tissue response. We'll go through that now. All the smoothness is a criteria by which scaling and root planning are immediately evaluated. The ultimate evaluation is based on tissue response. Clinical evaluation of soft tissue response to scaling and root planning, including probing, should not be conducted earlier than two weeks post-operatively. The reason is, yeah, as some of you are rightly choosing, re-epithelialization takes time. So, as clearly mentioned, right? So, re-epithelialization of wounds created during instrumentation takes at least one to two weeks. Until then, gingival bleeding on probing can be expected even when calculus has been completely removed because the soft tissue wound is not epithelialized. Any gingival bleeding on probing noted after this interval of one to two weeks is more likely the result of persistent inflammation, as some of you have chosen now, produced by residual deposits not removed during initial procedure or inadequate block control. So the summary here is immediately, if you're noticing bleeding or probing, that is normal, expected, anticipated. Because of the process of scaling and root planning, there is wound formation on the inner tissue side of, on the tissue wall. And re-epithelialization takes at least one to two weeks. And within that, right, probing is not indicated as clearly mentioned here. If you probe, there will be bleeding on probing, which doesn't mean that there is persistent inflammation. It only means that there is wound formation. Hello, sometime. And uh, that's the reason why our dentist in this particular context has rescheduled another appointment after two weeks to evaluate the tissue response. As clearly mentioned in literature, the immediate indicator of good scaling is the amount of smoothness that you create, even though that's not very significant, but long-term, it's a tissue response which ultimately indicates the effectiveness of scaling and root planning, including calculus removal in the process, right? So as majority of you have rightly chosen, option C is right answer. If there is bleeding or probing, even after one to two weeks after scaling, Obviously, it could be a sign of persistent inflammation because of residual calculus deposits, right? I hope it's clear. Very good. Well done to award yourself plus four. Now, let's move on to the next question. Which of the following is not an application of ultrasonic scalars? You know, we have magnetostrictive, piezoelectric. Again, we have sonic, ultrasonic. So, ultrasonic scalars, which most of us use commonly in our routine clinical practice, even interns for that matter, final years the periodontics posting. So, which of the following is not an application of ultrasonic scalars? Plaque and stain removal, SRP or scaling and root planing, curating or curatage, surgical debridement. <clears throat> so, which one do you think is not an application of ultrasonic scalar? As you know, we use it for removing calculus, right? So, that's a basic thing. So what else are the applications or not the applications of ultrasonic scalars? So try answering this question. In the meantime, I will review some information. Yes. Ultrasonic scalars have the following applications. Before I reveal the applications, there are two main types of uh, ultrasonic units, as you know, magnetostrictive and piezoelectric. In both types, 
AC current, alternating current is used which generates oscillations in materials and handpiece leading to vibration of tips, as you know. Depending on the manufacturer, the ultrasound vibrations at the tip of instruments range from 18,000 to 50,000 hertz or cycles per second in case of ultrasonic. In case of sonic, vibrations are in the range of 2,500 to 7,000 cycles per second. And also they're available in different sizes and shapes, larger ones for removing larger deposits, finer ones to enter sub ginger valley. So that, that's all basic. So which one do you think is not an application of ultrasonic scale? And to complete my textbook review, literature review, ultrasonic scalers may be used for removing plaque and stains. You might have removed stains. In fact, you, you would have felt that pleasure of removing stains with ultrasonic scaler because it's hand, hand, stain, hand scaling. Uh, I can understand how challenging it is. Also, this is, uh, you use uh, hydrogen peroxide, right? So stain removal is very challenging with uh, manual means, but ultrasonic scalers, it's very, very convenient. So plaque and stain removal can be done. Scaling and root planing is usually done. Curettage and surgical debridement are also applications of ultrasonic scalers. In fact, we have a question related to curators, which we'll deal with in the form of homework question. So all of the following are applications of ultrasonic scaler, and none of you have chosen none. So all of you are going to get minus one. So each of the following is not an application of ultrasonic scalers. All of the following mentioned here are applications, so none is right answer. So don't get demotivated. At least you have learned this and make sure that you're not repeating this mistake. Okay. Now let's move on to the third question. We have two statements. Vibration energy dislodges calculus from tooth surfaces and acoustic turbulence of water serves to flush these deposits from the pocket. Statement one. This is related to mechanism of action of ultrasonic scalers. Statement two. Magnetostrictive ultrasonic inserts generate heat and require water for cooling. Whereas sonic and piezoelectric units do not generate heat and hence don't require water. So after going through these two statements, which one do you think is right? Statement one is true, statement two is false, vice versa, or both statements are true, both statements are false. Danish, you know, very good. <laughs> so which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So as I was mentioning previously in the previous literature, questions literature review, ultrasonic and sonic tips of different shapes and sizes are available. Larger tips are used for removal of heavy supragingival calculus and heavy subgingival calculus where tissue is inflamed and retractable. Thinner tips are designed for more definite subgingival debridement. All tips are designed to operate in a wet field with water spray directed at the end of the tip. This is very, very important and let me repeat. All tips are designed to operate in a wet field with the water spray directed at the end of the tip. Consider that very, very important. And this vibrational energy which is being created through oscillations within the handpiece, which is again, the source is your alternating current. So alternating current, oscillations and vibration energy. So this vibrational energy as mentioned a statement one, dislodges calculus and biofilm from the tooth surfaces and acoustic streaming and acoustic turbulence, the terms which we'll discuss a bit later in final question. So this acoustic streaming and acoustic turbulence of water serves to flush these deposits from the pocket or from the designated area. Magnetostrictive ultrasonic inserts generate heat and hence require water for cooling purpose. However, sonic and piezoelectric units do not generate heat but still utilize water for cooling because you know there is frictional heat generation. Also, we need flushing action, right? So for these reasons, water is required. So among the given options, as majority of you have rightly mentioned, option A is right answer. Of course, you need water while you're using ultrasonic scalar, right? So they do not generate heat, but still, there is frictional heat generation. Again, there can be trauma to tooth, trauma to pulp, right? So you need water coolant and also you need a um, medium to flush out the debris. 
So statement one is true, statement two is false, as almost every one of you have rightly chosen. So do award yourself plus four. This must be so less for you, right? Because the previous question was uh, comparatively challenging. Very good. Well done. Now let's move on to the penultimate question. Contraindications for use of ultrasonic scaling devices include all except, let's see how many of you are going to answer it right. So you should understand or know the contraindications of ultrasonic scalers because this is something which we apply very commonly in our uh, clinical practice, not just perio, but also surgery, but also endo, right? Various applications of these uh, ultrasonics in dentistry. So what are the contraindications? So option A, patients with older cardiac pacemakers or patients with known communicable diseases like COVID or patients with risk for respiratory disease like immunocompromised patients or titanium implant surfaces or porcelain respirations. Can you go for ultrasonic scaling? So contraindications for use of ultrasonic scaling devices include all except. So what's the right answer? So let's see how many of you are going to answer it right. So there are some contraindications for use of ultrasonic as well as sonic scaling devices as mentioned in Carenzo. Magnetostrictive, or it can be piezoelectric. Magnetostrictive, in specific, have been reported to interfere with function of older cardiac pacemakers. In a recent independent study, a piezoelectric dental scaler produced no electromagnetic interference with defibrillators. Piezoelectric is relatively safe. Patients with newer pacemakers can be treated safely. However, there may be risk if the patient is medically fragile or if the electronically defective ultrasonic devices are used. That's the reason why medical consultation is advised when treating patients with such conditions. What about communicable diseases such as COVID-19? I mean, needless to say that we should avoid sonic ultrasonic scaling in such patients to prevent spread of aerosols, right? So it's contraindicated, as you know. So patients with known communicable diseases that can be transmitted by aerosols should not be treated with ultrasonic or sonic scaling devices. The water spray creates contaminated aerosol that fills the operating area, exposing not just the surfaces, but also the operating personnel and also the assistants. Even when treating patients without known communicable diseases, it is especially important that a proper infection control measures be observed, such as using personal protective equipment, eyewear, masks, gloves, and proper surface decontamination be performed afterward. And most importantly, do make a note of this point, pre-rinsing for one minute with an antimicrobial mouthwash, such as 0.12% chlorhexidin, significantly reduces the number of bacteria and aerosol for approximately 60 minutes or one hour. Consider this very, very important. And let me repeat, pre-rinsing for one minute with an antimicrobial mouthwash such as 0.12% chlorhexidine significantly reduces the number of bacteria and aerosol for approximately one hour. Even though it doesn't eliminate, reduces the number. And patients at risk for respiratory disease should not be treated with ultrasonic or sonic devices, including patients who are immunosuppressed or have chronic pulmonary disorders. Finally, metal ultrasonic and sonic inserts are contraindicated for titanium implant surfaces or porcelain or ceramic or bonded restorations, which can be either fractured or for which we have plastic or Teflon coated as you already know. So magnetostrictive piezoelectric plastic tipped ultrasonic inserts that do not cause damage to titanium implants are available. Also plastic and Teflon coated sonic scalar tips have been developed for titanium implants and for deep flaking and subgingival polishing of root surfaces. So as majority of you have uh, later rightly chosen, none is a right answer. So all of them are contraindications. None of them is an indication, right? So I hope it's clear. Well done. Go award yourself plus four if you're chosen now. Now let's move on to the final question. Consider this very, very important in terms of the principles of working of ultrasonic and the uh, ultrasonic instruments in specific. During ultrasonic scaling, which of the following effects is contributed by water? Because as you know, water is being used, macrostrictive, or it can be uh, piezoelectric. Water is an essential component, right? 
So during ultrasonic scaling, which of the following effects is contributed by water? Is it acoustic streaming or is it acoustic turbulence or is it cavitation or is it only B and C? So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So first of all, let's look into the meanings of these terms, acoustic streaming, acoustic turbulence, and then cavitation. So I'll also give you an illustration, but before that, acoustic streaming is unidirectional fluid flow caused by ultrasound waves. It's an unidirectional fluid flow. Acoustic turbulence is created when the movement of tip causes the coolant to accelerate, producing an intensified swirling effect in case of acoustic turbulence. And this turbulence continues until cavitation occurs. Cavitation means bubble formation. So cavitation is formation of bubbles in water caused by high turbulence. The bubbles implode and produce shock waves in the liquid, creating further shock waves throughout the water. In vitro combination of acoustic streaming, acoustic turbulence and cavitation have been shown to disrupt microflora. So combination of these effects is essential for disrupting microflora. So acoustic streaming in summary is unidirectional flow of fluid. Acoustic fluid, it can be gas, it can be liquid. In this situation, it's liquid. Acoustic turbulence is because movement of tip, the stream is disturbed and there is turbulence or swirling effect and cavitation is bubble formation, which explodes, transmitting shock waves, which uh, disseminate and then you know disturb the microflora right so these are some of the principles which are very very important based on which the power scalers actually work the mechanism of action so which among the following is contributed by water it seems you got the pulse right so acoustic streaming acoustic turbulence and cavitation are right answer so a b and c so those are chosen all three award yourself plus four if I choose an anyone, yeah, it's tough to answer, right? It's tough to give you a score. If you're choosing any one of the options, you can give yourself 0 0.33 marks. Okay. Yeah. Right. 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33. Or you can make it 0 0.4. I think 33 is fine. Yeah. So as you can see, acoustic cavitation and streaming. So left illustration can find cavitation and right illustration, it's about uh, streaming, like the illustration. So as clearly mentioned, initially there is acoustic streaming. This streaming will lead to turbulence eventually with movement of these uh, vibrations, which ultimately end up in the form of cavitations. So it's because of this acoustic turbulence, acoustic streaming, acoustic cavitation, that there is disruption of microflora. Consider that very, very important. And cavitation, bubble formation, which burst and send shock waves throughout, leading to disruption ultimately. Right? I hope it's clear. So as majority of you are smartly chosen, A, B, and C are right answers, all of which are contributed by water. Right? So before we conclude, you have the following homework questions. First question, why is local anesthesia injected into gingiva for ultrasonic curatage? One of the indications of ultrasonic is curatage as you have already answered in the first or second question. So while going ahead with ultrasonic curatage of gingiva, why is LA injected? It's a true statement, but why do we inject local anesthesia or anesthetic solution into gingiva for ultrasonic curatage? Second question, what's the pattern of vibration of tip? in magnetostrictive and piezoelectric units. So mention the directions or the pattern of vibration. And third question, why is excessive pressure not recommended for using ultrasonic instruments, while using ultrasonic instruments? Usually they say gentle pressure, mild pressure, but not excessive pressure. Why? What's the drawback of uh, applying excessive pressure? What happens to vibrations? What happens to tooth surface? So try exploring in those areas, refer standard literature, and feel free to contact us through mail uh, so that we can give you, analyze your work and provide your key accordingly, right? I hope it's clear. So this concludes our today's case-based discussion made easy session.
So to summarize all that we have discussed so far, you first reply to your friendly neighborhood dentist saying that brother, bleeding on probing is common on second day or within one week. So please convey to the patient that he or she has nothing to worry about. It's only because of wound formation, which is natural. And also reophthalization takes time, usually one to two weeks. And ultimately, it's a tissue response which gives us the best indication, like how the performance of the procedure was or the relevance of procedure in that particular patient. And if there is still bleeding on probing, it means there is persistent infection, inflammation, and obviously, we should either go for again another appointment of scaling and root planing, curettage, or surgical procedures, depending upon the etiology over there. Right. And also in the context, in the process, you have seen some related aspects to ultrasonic uh, scaling and ultrasonic instruments. And if you have any queries, you need any further assistance, feel free to contact us through mail 24 by 7. Right. So, by the way, uh, <laughs> how much was your score? So, how did you guys score in this session? It's a 20 marks. LA to avoid discomfort in inflamed area. So do you think LA works in an infected or inflamed area, Sidra? No, that's not the reason. That's not the right answer, by the way. Yes. So I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope you learned something uh, new in the process. And even if you're wrong, you have nothing to worry about because you learned something in the process and you're not going to repeat the same, obviously. So a few more days to your final exam, 25 plus days or 25 days we have been counting. So I'm sure you're excited. If you're worried or tensed, please contact us through mail. We'll talk to you. And also we'll uh, plan one live one-on-one -on -one interaction very soon uh, via Zoom. And we'll let you know the details accordingly. Right? So be strong, believe in yourself and don't believe in all rumors out there. Follow the information given only in your official website, snapboard.edu.in, nb.edu.in, mcc.nic.in, and also dciindia.goe.in. So all the information which we post in the form of updates, especially related to these exam notifications, are from these official websites only, right? So 10, 15, 12, 11, 9, very good. Now sometimes, you know, as I keep on saying, uh, it doesn't matter how much you score, but if you're scoring well, there is always scope for improvement. Even if you score 20 upon 20, there is always scope for improvement in, in, in learning perspective, right? Uh, Sidra, uh, yeah, no, we're not aware of any petitions, but anyways, as I said, we'll keep a tab on the official websites and uh, if there is any relevant information, they're not going to hide any information from us. It might be delayed by one day, right? But it, it's okay. Uh, Supreme Court verdicts and all, even if it is delayed in official website by one day, it's okay. But follow only information that's available in your official websites. Because if you believe uh, in some update based on a third party website, it will create a kind of hell which is not necessary at this particular point of time. My point is very simple. Uh, whether exam is postponed or whether exam uh, is going to be on that particular date, it should really, it doesn't matter because you have been preparing, exam has already been postponed once. Just carry on with your preparation, assuming that March 6th is going to be the final exam day. And if it is postponed, it's okay. You will have some additional time to revise, but let's hope that everything goes as per the schedule. And as I already said, let's keep a tab on the official website. And if you get carried away by all the information that's out there, especially nonsensical information, it will only affect your current preparation. And obviously it will have a negative impact on your tomorrow. So don't let that happen, right? Ranjit. Ranjit, as I've been telling you, Keep it up on the official website, snapboard.edu.in and b.edu.in. I'm not going to give you any new information because I'm not the person who will be conducting this exam. So NB has clearly mentioned about the date. So 
as of now march 6 2022 is the date of your neat mbs 2022 exam and don't keep asking everyone is the exam postponed is the exam postponed because each one will give their own opinion so we don't want this nonsense to you at this point of time so do not bother about nonsense even if i say something about exam date it's all nonsense i'm telling you very frankly what way is that going to help you in your preparation just follow the information given in your official website stick on to that and if there is any change or any important update we'll get back to you like we have been getting back to you for the past several years through our updates group and also through our youtube channel of course if the topic is very important we'll even make a video on this thing right in fact very recently they have been asking whether neat mbs be postponed as neat pg was postponed so we, we immediately shot a video and we posted it on our youtube channel and surprisingly it garnered thousands of views within one day breaking news always have this you know uh, tendency to attract more views but if it is subject video or if it is something which actually helps us in our personal professional life usually they get uh, less attention that's how society is that's how we all are unfortunately it has to be breaking news in order to catch our attention it has to be negative news for something to catch our attention and this has to change right we don't need breaking news every day we want peace of mind we want happiness we want exuberance all of this is possible not through breaking news not through negative news not through postponements and all so please try to maintain your peace of mind at least in the last few days of your final exam don't keep pan panicking and don't keep believing in rumors right if there is any postponement news uh, let's see how we we have to deal with it accordingly and also we'll get back to you with relevant updates yeah exactly it doesn't matter anymore because i know you all, you all have been tested first they said june and then they said march i know you all have been tested you, know, you all have been stretched maximum i don't think any news would further make any difference uh, even your preparation would not uh, your momentum also will not break take my word yeah right okay guys take care so love you all good night